So, so this is uh, um, work that's done by my PhD student, Aulin Shu, um, on distributed function computation. I'm merely the conduit for his brilliance. Um, OK, so, so here's the problem that, that we're looking at. Um, we have a network of nodes, and each node holds a random observation. We know the joint distribution of those observations. Each node wants to compute some function of everybody's observations. We assume that the function is the same for all nodes. And the nodes communicate only to their neighbors um, over noisy channels. And uh, the graph is directed. And each edge corresponds to a channel. So let's be a little bit more formal about it. So we have the network model. Uh, it's going to be a directed graph G with vertex set V. That's enumerating the nodes. And edge set E. And essentially, we're saying that if um, two nodes, U and V, are connected by an edge, it means that node U can send messages to node V. OK, and uh, the communication is noisy. And that means that if I have a network, so here's a node U. Here's a node V. They're connected by an edge in my network. Um, this edge corresponds to a noisy channel with um, some input, uh, input alphabet X sub E, output alphabet Y sub E. Right. So for each edge, we have a pair of input output alphabets. And then we have a noisy channel denoted by K sub E that connects them. And each edge in the network has such a noisy channel. So that means that these are point-to-point -point links. And I'm going to assume that all of the uh, input output alphabets are finite. Um, OK, so this is, this is a communication model, right? So, so, so that means that, and, and node U, of course, can receive messages from other nodes. It may have other uh, destinations, et cetera. OK, so this is the network model. Um, here's the computation model. So each node holds a random observation. So uh, WV is initial observation. Uh, the vector of all of the observations, just call it W, has some joint distribution, which we assume known. And all the nodes know it. And the goal is compute a random variable z, which is some fixed function of all the nodes. Um, and of course, this is done through local communication and computation. Right, so, so local communication and computation, nodes initially start knowing only their uh, input to the function. And then everybody wants to compute this function by talking to each other. And I'm interested in the smallest number of rounds that this can take place um, for the function to be computed at every node with a certain accuracy and certain confidence. So um, essentially, what's going to happen is we have an algorithm. So the, the, uh, an algorithm is just a collection of encoders. So each node decides on a message to send to all of its neighbors. And uh, the messages are noisy, right? So if node U sends a message to node V, that message is going to be noisy. Uh, and in the same way, if node W sends a message to node U, that message is going to be noisy. So this is synchronous. So at each discrete time step, each node decides on messages to send to its, um, uh, to its neighbors in, in a graph. And, and then at the end of t rounds, each node takes the information it has and computes an estimate of the function. So we have so, so uh, a, a t round algorithm called A is just a collection of encoders. Um, I'm just going to denote them by phi vt. So each node v at each time t decides what to send to uh, all of its neighbors. And then uh, estimators. Uh, psi v, and I only care about estimators for, uh, because I want to, you know, com, uh, conserve writing on the board. The idea is, at the end of t steps, after t rounds, each node computes 
its own estimate z hat v. And this estimate is a function of that node's initial observation and called yv uh, t. So, so this is the uh, t-tuple of all the messages received by node v in t rounds. All right? OK, and so, so the goal, the goal is to epsilon delta. So I'm going to be inventing a term, epsilon delta compute f, which means, that, which means the following. So uh, essentially, I'm going to look at the probability that I'm going to, uh, I'm going to posit a distortion function or a loss function d, um, and the probability that the distance between, or distortion between node v estimate of z and z is greater than epsilon. This probability is less than one my, um, less than delta. Sorry about that. Less than delta, and in the worst case, over all the nodes. Right. Okay. So, so this is different. So, uh, and I'm interested in the number of rounds. So this is different from the usual uh, communication complexity where the currency is bits. So nodes communicate through, uh, amongst themselves, and we look at the number of bits that needs to be sent here. The alphabets may be different, uh, and at each round, each node only sends one symbol to each of the neighbors from their corresponding alphabets. And I'm interested in the number of rounds. So I'm defining the following quantity. I'm sorry? Yes, yes. Um, right, so, so I'm interested in the following quantity. T of epsilon delta is going to be the minimum number of rounds such that there exists a T round algorithm A that epsilon delta computes F. That's why I, I, I love coming to, to France and give board talks. The chalk is amazing. The board is amazing. It's, it's just such tactile feedback is incredible. OK, so this is what I'm interested in. So, so this talk is about information theoretic lower bounds on this. Uh, and there have been results in the literature for deterministic computation. A lot of times you can actually see the, is the diameter of the graph. Um, for noisy, fun, uh, noisy uh, channels, most of the existing bounds actually don't capture the diameter of the graph. And we're kind of w wondering why that is. Are there in, in, intrinsic limitations to information theoretic methods that uh, don't allow you to capture it. On the other hand, also, here we're talking about random, um, random average case kind of stuff. So in some cases, you don't need any communication at all, and everybody knows the function. For example, if the function is constant, the diameter shouldn't play a role at all. I mean, the number of rounds is zero because everybody knows that, that constant value. So we want to kind of capture uh, the structure of the function, the structure of the graph, the capacities of the channel, uh, and the I impact of the prior distribution of Ws. I'm just trying to see how much, oh, eight minutes. Um, and, and, and the impact of the prior distribution on, uh, uh, on W on the uh, computation time. OK? So, so this, is the, this is the question. And of course, you know, I'm, I'm not indicating the dependence of this on the network structure, on the function, on PW, et cetera. This is all implicit. So here's, going to be, here, here's what the general strategy um, is going to look like. So, so the idea is a general framework or general idea, general strategy. So we're going to fix a subset of nodes and some node in that subset. And then what we're going to do is we're going to look at and then we're going to, of course, you know, uh, uh, fix some algorithm. And we're going to look at the following quantity. We're looking, we're looking at the conditional mutual information between the function value that we wish to compute and the estimate that node v has after t rounds given all of the initial observations in the set containing in the set S containing V. So at some point, I am going to appeal to cut set arguments here, but let's think about what, what this means. So assume that nodes in S somehow manage to spread all the information. So all nodes in S know this vector. So 
All nodes in S know their observation, so all the information that they need to compute has to come from S complement. Now, uh, and for the moment, assuming that everything is discrete, we can write this as the conditional entropy of the function value given just the observations, uh, minus the conditional entropy of the function value given the observations and the z hat v. And z hat v, you remember, it includes messages coming from other nodes in, in S complement. So this is the reduction of uncertainty about the function value compare, uh, First, you only know the measurements, the observations in S, but then you also, information arrives from the complement, so we want to know uh, what this is. So what we're going to do is we're going to lower bound this and upper bound this. And then, you know, from that, we're going to deduce a bound on, on the computation time. So, uh, so here's, and the, here's the idea. Um, so there will be two bounds. One will be like this. Uh, I want to keep that here, actually. It's kind of a, as, as a useful uh, reminder. So assume that this al algorithm A epsilon delta computes F and takes T rounds. Sending of one message by each node to all of their neighbors. One, one message corresponds to a no, one message corresponds to a single symbol. Oh. So each node, right, so um, um, you think about edges, so directed edges, so each directed edge corresponds to a single message from that alphabet, so each round corresponds to each edge uh, having a transmission of one symbol. Yes. Okay, so suppose, that, so suppose that we have an algorithm which epsilon delta computes F and takes T rounds. We're going to establish two things. First, we're going to establish that um, essentially this mutual information, conditional mutual information, is going to be lower bounded by some function called psi 1, which is going to depend on the choice of s, our uh, accuracy and confidence, and uh, you know, we're going to assume it's non-zero, show that it's non-zero. So in other words, if the algorithm epsilon delta computes f, then it's going to extract some non-trivial information about the function value. On the other hand, we're going to show that because of the network limitations, there's going to be some upper bound of the form psi 2 that's going to depend only on the network structure on the set S and on time. And this has to satisfy, that, this has to be satisfied by all choices of um, S. And that tells us, if we can find such bounds, that the uh, epsilon delta computation time has to satisfy the following system of constraints, psi 1 of uh, S epsilon delta is smaller than psi 2 of s t of epsilon delta for all subsets of the vertices. And then if we can invert this, then, you know, then we'll, we'll have a bound. So this will be the general strategy that we're going to follow. OK. Not bad. OK. So now I'm going to detail the two um, um, the bounds, lower and upper bounds. I'm not going to give proofs most of the time because um, that's not what you do with a board talk, I guess. But I'm, I'm going to convey as much intuition as possible. Uh, so I'm going to give one particular lower bound on I that we believe is probably um, the tightest bound over what, uh, what exists out there in the literature and subsumes things like Fano's inequality and whatnot. And uh, two upper bounds. One is based on cut set arguments, uh, which is more or less classic. And the other one is based on strong data processing inequalities and uh, gives you much better results in many cases. OK, so, so let's look at, uh, at lower bounds first. So I, I'm lower bounding the, the, this uh, conditional mutual information first. So I want to. Uh, by the way, the, I, my eyesight is terrible, so if somebody like raises a hand to ask a question, I won't see it. So if there's a question, please just um, say it out loud. Okay, so I'm going to define the following uh, quantity. I'm going to call it the conditional small ball probability and it's going to, um, so I fix a set S. And this uh, is a function L of 
Ws, which is a tuple of deterministic tuple of Ws indexed by the uh, vertices in S, and epsilon. And it's going to look like this. It's going to be the largest probability over all possible elements of the space in which the function takes values of the probability that the distance between or the distortion between the actual function and this point is less than epsilon. Uh, oh, conditionally on, so this is a conditional distribution, conditioned on some part of the function's input. So let's think about what this means. This essentially um, quantifies the, the ease or difficulty of localizing the function value up to error epsilon knowing some of the inputs. So if I were to kind of draw the distribution or the, the density of, of, this, uh, of this thing, so I'm assuming it's not negative, so density kind of would look like this, let's say. Um, I'm looking at all possible intervals of length epsilon or two epsilon and just looking at the largest probability mass. Right, so here it's gonna be somewhere here. Um, so this quantifies how spread the distribution of, um, of the function is given the values of some arguments. So if this quantity is small, it means that essentially even if I know a part of the function's input, it's difficult for me to localize the function value to within error epsilon. And the lower bound on the, and so, so therefore we state the following lemma. The mutual, inf so for any s and any uh, v and s, the mutual information between the function value, oh, well, I should, I guess, uh, preamble it properly. If uh, algorithm alpha epsilon delta computes f, then the mutual information, conditional mutual information between the function value and each node's estimate of that function value given the measurements in, or the initial observations in S is greater than or equal to the following quantity, one minus delta, which is my accuracy, times log of one over the expected value of this L over WS and epsilon, right? Because this WS is the, uh, is the um, you're conditioning on part of the function's input, and here I'm averaging that with respect to the initial distribution of Ws minus h2 of w, where h2 of w is the binary entropy function. So it's minus delta log delta minus 1 minus delta log 1 minus delta. And here I'm assuming that um, logarithms are to base 2, binary, binary logarithms. So, so this, is a, a, this is a general lower bound. And you see that it captures the interplay between the accuracy, which is the delta, and then the sensitivity of the function to, um, or predictability of the function to within error epsilon, knowing some of its inputs. And this bound actually subsumes Fano's inequality, various distance-based versions of Fano's inequality that have been you know, presented in literature for continuous random variables. Uh, and, it's, and it's actually rather tight. Um, and we can actually upper bound these quantities for a variety of computations. For example, if the function is a linear combination of, uh, uh, of real measurements, we can actually relate it to something called Levy concentration function. So this actually can be computed in many cases. The proof is uh, a very simple kind of a thing. It, it uses data processing uh, inequality for relative entropy and Markov's inequality. Okay, so that's the lower bound and it's, and it's going to kind of stay there. Okay, and now, now for the upper bounds. I'm going to present two upper bounds. Uh, still on, a, on that mutual information. So the first upper bound is going to be the cut set bound. And it's, it's a classic kind of a thing. It's more, as far as I know, there's more or less folklore. Although, you know, there, um, in textbooks on information theory like Cover and Thomas, there's a more general version of it, which is more asymptotic and having to do with sum rates. This is, I guess, non-asymptotic version. But, uh, but so this is our network. So what we do is, so this is, we, we, we use a cut to separate the network into S and S complement. And then we're going to look at all edges, all channels 
that originate in S complement and terminate in S. And the cut set is just a set of all edges UV such that the uh, starting point is in S complement and the ending point is in S. And um, we're going to define this quantity called cut set capacity is simply going to be the sum over all edges in uh, this cut set of C sub E's. And C sub E is the Shannon capacity of, of the channel on edge E. And since I assume that all, all, all uh, alphabets are finite, this is well defined. Right, so, so this is the, um, this is the bound, this is the, this is the quantity we care about. Uh, this is the, the, the ge geometric graph theoretic setup. So, so we have another lemma, and it states the following. Uh, for any T round algorithm A, mutual information between Z and the estimate at node V is upper bounded by T times C sub S. And as I, as I said, this is more or less folklore. I mean, it's been around and it's, uh, it's a standard thing. The only contribution that, that we've had is that we've, um, we can, came up with a proof that, that uses uh, just the um, properties of mutual information. For, because for example, if Z is continuous valued, there are proofs that use differential entropy. I try to avoid using differential entropy uh, because it's, you know, it, it's a nasty behaving quantity. And if you want to use differential entropy, then you cannot assume that the function all the nodes want to compute is the same because then you might end up with infinite differential entropy. So you have to perturb things a little bit. So we came up with a proof that doesn't need any, anything, just uses properties of mutual information. Okay, so, so let me kind of number these lemmas. So this is going to be lemma one, this is going to be lemma two. There's one, there's one obvious, um, limitation of this bound, uh, well, there, there are two limitations of this bound. One, of course, is, um, so this, this grows linearly with t, but suppose that your z is, um, z is a function of w's. So suppose your w's are discrete. Then this should saturate at the conditional entropy of ws uh, complement given, given s, right? Because mutual information between z and uh, z hat is upper bounded by mutual information between w in s complement and z hat. And this is just data processing inequality. And this in turn is upper bounded by the conditional entropy of what you don't know, the inputs that you don't know, given the inputs that you know. And of course, you know, so that means that you have to max it out, right? So you have to, you have to take the maximum of this and that and, and get a bound that actually saturates nicely. But even then, it's still not enough because somehow it doesn't capture um, this idea that channels that carry information from the cut set, fr uh, from across the cut set, um, the information also has to spread within S. So one way in which we decided to improve upon this or you know, uh, learn to improve upon this is, is to use strong data processing inequalities. Yes? Oh. Where's the button? Um, which one is that? Oh, this? I don't know which, bu which, which button does that. Because all the, all the uh, writing is in French. I only understand the one that, that says, ah, how wonderful. Oh, the green is to move up, okay. But there are several green buttons. Yeah, and then this is to there stop. Are, oh, I see. That's where it gets. Okay, <laughs> thank you. Um, okay, and I'm still doing well in terms of time, surprisingly. I have 10 minutes left, which is just fine. Um, okay, so, so then we, we uh, came up with another upper bound based on strong data processing inequalities. Um, again, as a reminder, uh, if I have from, from this morning, we've heard about strong data processing inequalities. If I have a, a stochastic transformation, channel K, with uh, input alphabet, let's say, uh, X, output alphabet Y, and then I introduce a Markov chain. So I, so I code 
uh, I have u, I, I map it to an input, and then uh, channel output is produced. The mutual information between, so we define a strong data processing constant, eta of k, as the supremum over all such Markov chains under the constraint that the mapping from x to, u to y is implemented by k of the ratio of the mutual information between end-to-end -end mutual information and mutual information between u and x. Okay, so, uh, so essentially here, here's how we're going to do this. We're going to define, so for each node v, let e sub v be just the edges that send information to, to v, right? So here's my node v. It has various nodes, the u that send information to it. It's, it's the supremum over all such Markov chains where uh, the, <coughs> yes, and the, uh, the conditional distribution of x to y is implemented by k, so it's fixed. And I look at the ratio of mu mutual information between u and y and u and x. I know by data processing equality that this is always less than one, but in, in, uh, in some cases, strictly smaller than one. So this was, was a quantity that uh, uh, appeared in a talk by uh, Ankit Garg uh, this morning. So th essentially, it's, it's a measure of how, at, uh, b by what amount, the channel k destroys information. OK, so, so I define E sub v as the collection of all edges incident on v. So all edges, all nodes that can send information to v. and uh, this defines a channel. How does it define the channel? Essentially, uh, what I do is I, um, so for each edge, we have a dedicated input alphabet and output alphabet. So message comes from node u to node v. Another message comes from node u prime to node v. I look at the channel that maps all messages from all of the um, senders to v to whatever v receives. So, so call this case of v. It's, it's, it's easier to explain it in words than, than to, uh, than to, than to Describe a channel um, for all messages to V. And uh, I'm going to call A sub, A sub V is going to be this data processing constant of that channel. So I mean, if you want to be precise, the way, the way this channel would work is you would look at all edges So all the, all the nodes that, that, so messages to V, well, received messages to V. And it's going to be product over all edges in this edge set of the corresponding, maybe that's easier to, uh, to explain, right? So what we're doing is we're saying the uh, channel noises are independent in each edge. Each node that can send information to V is going to provide an input and uh, node V is going to see, see some output. And we're looking at the data processing constant of, of that. So, so here's lemma three. And it gives the following uh, upper bound on the conditional mutual information between the function value and, and V, uh, and, and the estimated function value. It's smaller than uh, the conditional entropy of WSC given WS, and here I'm assuming this, you know, assuming this entropy is finite, times times the following: it's one minus one minus eta v raised to t. So this is actually kind of nice, because uh, essentially it tells us that this information is going to saturate at this conditional entropy, and it's going to do so gracefully. It's going to do it like this. And the proof is based on um, a very, actually, very uh, uh, old paper. Well, now, now it's, it's funny. You can talk about papers from, from the 90s as old. Uh, by Evans and Schulman, where they considered this for, for binary uh, channels. They were interested in uh, noisy uh, Boolean networks and signal propagation and limitations on depth of, in noisy Boolean circuits. So they uh, obtained something like this. It's, it's, in, it's in the guts of the proof. And it was extended recently by uh, uh, Yuri Polyansky and Yi Hong Wu to um, Bayesian networks, arbitrary alphabets, what have you. So it uses kind of a recursive argument, data processing, to, to arrive at this. So therefore, we, we obtain uh, one lower bound on the mutual information and two upper bounds, and we can use them to um, assemble them to solve for t and get lower bounds on t. So, uh, and you know, I'm going to leave that up to um, 
uh, you know, the collective imagination to figure out how to, how to do it. I'm going to demonstrate a particular example before I uh, describe. Let's see how well am I doing? Oh, okay, so five minutes. Left. So I'm gonna I'm, I'm just going to give uh, a bound for the very simple network. Two nodes. Because if your bounds are uh, uh, you know not good for for simple networks, you're you're doing it wrong. So two nodes, each connected by a binary symmetric channel with crossover probability p. W1, W2 are IID Bernoulli half, and the function you want to compute is just a modulo two sum. And I'm interested in zero error, epsilon equals zero, but probability of error being um, probability of error uh, being delta. So here, so the, we get two bounds, and they are tighter in different circumstances. So zero error, and the bounds look like this. So from the cut set, we get, and remember, I'm talking about binary logarithms. So one minus delta minus bin binary entropy of, of delta divided by one minus h2 of p. So this is the cut set. And another bound is this. It's log over a log of 1 over 1 plus delta plus the entropy divided by a log of 1 over 4p times 1 minus p. And this is SDPI. And these, so, so this bound is better for larger values of delta, so larger uh, probabilities of error. This bound is, is, is the correct scaling when delta is close to 0, because it, as you can see, when delta goes to 0, this blows up. So these two bounds actually deliver. So cut set argument, uh, cut set bounds are not good for um, for delta close to zero because we know that as, as as you because the communication is noisy, you expect higher and higher accuracy. It should take you longer and longer time. But this bound is going to saturate at one divided by one minus h two of p. This is just the capacity of the binary symmetric channel. This is one minus the strong data processing constant. Um, okay, and I, and in the remaining time, I'm just going to briefly say. Uh, that this is still inadequate because it doesn't capture the diameter of the graph. So how do we capture the diameter of the graph? Essentially, we said, so this all considers, ultimately, we're still doing a cut set. It's just that we're, we're analyzing it differently. The problem is that we take only one cut set. If you take several cut sets and consider information spreading through their succession, that will capture the uh, information flow in the network. So what we decided to do, what, we, what Aulian came up with is, he said the following. Suppose, suppose the network consists of bidirectional links, meaning that if there's an edge from U to V, there's an edge from V to U, so it's symmetric. Channels may be different on those edges. And then um, it's, it, you, can, you can erase the, collapse the two edges into one edge, talk about the graph diameter. Take two nodes that, are, uh, that have the lo longest graph distance between them and simply consider the following cuts. So here's my network. Here are two nodes, U0 and U1, that are separated by the graph diameter. Look at spheres in the graph distance. So this is um, graph distance equals 1, graph distance equals 2, et cetera. And, and these, are, these are going to be your, your sets. And you look at cuts between these sets, and you can see that because of the definition of the graph distance, for example, these are nodes that are one hop away from U0. They can only communicate with U0 and with nodes that are two hops away. Nodes that are two hops away can only communicate with nodes that are one hop away and three, et cetera. So what we can do is we can take each of these shells and represent them by a super node in a new network. And now the super nodes are connected by bidirectional links. So what we have is a chain of super nodes, one, two, and then we have graph diameter plus one, that's how many uh, nodes there'll be. They're, they're connected by edges that simulate communication between these super nodes. But then also remember that there's communication within each set. So this is also going to have self loops where nodes essentially, super nodes send noisy messages to themselves. They simulate this inter, uh, inter subset communication. And what we've done is we've derived, we, we extended the analysis in a beautiful paper by Raja Gopalan and Shulman to this case of bidirected links and self loops to actually show that essentially what's going to happen is the computation time for, let's say, I'm looking at exponentially decreasing uh, epsilon and delta 
is going to be something like big omega of n divided by a um, quantity called eta tilde. Eta tilde is uh, worst case data processing constant on the channels in this reduced network. Oh, yeah, n is the diameter. Of course, you know, the, the, the thing is that these partitions, th these, this decomposition may result in kind of very densely connected, very dense uh, cut sets. So that's going to be reflected in this eta tilde somehow. Uh, it, it, it's going to, you know, it, it's going to be closer to one when the network is very dense. Uh, but, but the nice thing about this is that this captures the graph diameter and we can apply it to things like trees, rings, um, line graphs and, uh, and grids and get bounds that actually scale reasonably with net network diameter. Uh, and I believe that actually the first time that, uh, to, to the best of our knowledge, that the, the one has information theoretic lower bounds for uh, distributed computation over a network of noisy channels that actually accounts for network diameter and distributional properties of the initial measurements. And uh, you know, just as a, so the obviously 35 minute talk can't do it justice, but I'll give you the archive number of this paper if you're interested. So the archive number of this is 1509.00514. And that's, that's the end.